As self-described gear geeks here at Weigh My Rack, we love learning about how gear gets developed and made. So when we were invited to Edelrid and offered unrestricted access to the rope making factory, we were psyched. It turns out, climbing ropes are made today using the same basic design and material as the original dynamic kern mantle rope released in 1964 by Edelrid. But modern ropes perform much, much better than those in past decades, which leads to the looming question. If ropes have been made using the same material and construction for the last 60 years, how do manufacturers continue to improve performance? All rope manufacturers nearly buy the same raw material, but the output is a totally different rope. That just shows that manufacturing and process has a big influence on quality. Due to process control, there had been um, big improvements made. Ten years ago, we could also do a 9 mil rope. But this 9 mil rope was only maybe with, let's say, 28 to 32 percent sheet proportion and now we can do a 8.6 millimeter rope with 45 percent sheet proportion. This is only possible due to process control I would say. Maybe some of the raw material had been slightly improved but due to the fact that we can tweak as well as have our processes designed by ourselves we can change the characteristics of raw materials even though the raw material has not changed too much we can do a much better rope. Lighter rope, more robust rope, abrasion resistant rope. We asked Edelrid to walk us through each step of the process and explain how each step influences the performance of the final product. The first step is raw material sourcing. Every modern climbing rope is made using nylon, also known as polyamide, for both the sheath and the core. For ropes, this plastic is melted, extruded, and drawn into ultra-thin filaments. These filaments are then combined to form yarn, which is the raw material for making ropes. After the yarn arrives at Edelrid, they get twisted together. So the first step would be the twisting of the yarn. For the core yarn, it's a double twisted yarn. Um, so we get that already twisted. This twist does give the yarn a certain dynamic because it's acting like a spring. And on the other hand, as it combines different and single fibers and therefore the abrasion resistance is getting much higher. There is different twisting possible. We can twist two layers, three, four, up to five, depending on what you want to achieve with uh, rope construction. Which kind of twisted sheet yarns you put on a rope really depends on the concept of the rope. It's always a combination of how is the inner made, what is the sheet looking like, on which machinery, and how is the machinery running in order to achieve the best output of the rope. During the twisting process, half of the yarn must be twisted to the right and half twisted to the left. If all of the yarn is twisted the same direction, the rope will naturally curl and kink. Edelrid twists their yarn between 100 and 140 times per meter. After the yarn is twisted, it goes into the autoclave to be shrunk. But for this step, it must be taken off the spools and loosely knit to ensure that every fiber is affected equally. We have to get a very loose bundle of yarn because if we just would do it on a, on a whole spool, you would not have the, the same shrinkage on the outer layers as well as on the inner layers. So one of the huge steps is um, shrinking the material. And we do shrink the core material and the sheet material for sure, otherwise it would not work together. One of the major aspects is to get dynamic into the material. So what we want to achieve in the autoclave, in the shrinking process, is we want to shrink the fibers in a certain way that it performs in the best way for the rope. This means we have different shrinking programs, obviously depending on the rope material and the rope construction. We have the temperature going up, steam comes in, then it's going to shrink, then just hold it for eight minutes, go down, go hotter, cool down, and this has like pressure, humidity, temperature, how it goes up, how it comes down. There's like five factors with some chemicals involved sometimes. And if you see, we have only two or three raw materials, but 15 right. programs means you can tweak the raw material to be specific for a certain product. 
the shrinkage process is one of the most important processes in order to make a good rope. The yarns from the sheath as well as from the inner will be shrinked up to 30%. After being removed from the autoclave, the sheath fibers must be de-knit and put back onto bobbins. These bobbins are placed into bins until they're ready to go into the braiding machine. So we work with two kind of different inners here. One is the twisted core and one is the braided core. The twisted core can be more dynamic, a little stiffer, a little less or more twisted. So we have basically a raw material and then we create different twisting for the inners accordingly to the, the specifications of the rope. At this stage, the core fibers are sent through a full bath to coat the core in its water repellent finish. The sheath will receive its water repellent finish treatment after the rope is braided. During the braiding process, there are five main variables that affect the final rope. The first is the number of bobbins on the machine. Yet now in the dynamic rope, there's two main machines we're working with. This is the 40 carrier and the 48 carrier. The carrier in this case means how many bobbins can be put on the machine. And the 48 obviously has eight bobbins more than a 40 -er. And this creates a little flatter surface of the rope. We can create the same diameter with a 40 or a 48 carrier. But on the 48 carrier, we make the single sheet yarns thinner. And this way, the percentage as well as the weight of the sheet actually on the same diameter of rope, even though it's made with a different carrier, is the same. It's mostly about how thick the yarn is and what kind of surfeit it creates on the rope. Then they must determine the ideal speed at which the rope is being pulled through the machine relative to how quickly the carriers are braiding. Next, they choose the tension of the yarns and the angle at which the fibers are being braided, as well as the diameter of the hole at which the rope is being pulled through. All of these factors get manipulated to achieve the desired characteristics of a given rope. Normally we are producing a roughly about 1,000 meters of a rope per production run. We do have a, a lot of knowledge in-house how we can, can work on, on handling issues and stuff like that. So, for example, the dry treated rope will be produced different on the machinery. Normally, if the, the ropes are treated before treating them, they feel kind of stiff. They are produced a little stiffer. So if you're running it through the machinery, they are softening itself, they are relaxing. We know that we have to, with a non-treated swift, for example, we have to adapt a few things on the braiding machineries so we get this touch even without running through the treatment. So if they come from the machinery, if they're going into the, to the sports line, they are more or less finished. If they are going in the pro line and they get the dry treatment, um, we have to put the dry treatment on. Before we are braiding the rope, we have to treat the core yarn as well. So every single core yarn is treated, then we are producing the rope and then we are treating the whole rope again. So only via doing this two-time treatment process, we were able to fulfill the UAA standard. With the uh, dynamic ropes, we are running every meter through the hands. So what we are looking about is issues concerning the touch. On the braiding machinery, for example, can happen um, that the uh, point where the, the, the yarns are braided together is just dropping down a little bit and um, just coming up again. So you will have a little piece of the rope which feels stiffer due to braid it in a, in a different braiding angle. It's not a safety relevant issue, but it is an issue where we say um, we don't want to have this coming to somebody buying an edelrit rope. Those ladies working down there, they, they've got a lot of experience as well and it's amazing which kind of small differences they are able to, to feel in the rope and we have not found a way to do this via a machine. After inspection, the ropes are sent through a machine that cuts the rope to the proper length and applies the middle mark. After the rope comes out of the machine, a person finishes the job by hand to make sure it's perfect. The rope terminations are then melted and taped. And finally, the rope is coiled and packaged for delivery. All of you have bought a rope in your life where you had perfect handling in the beginning and due to the lifespan you have seen that the change of the rope was like dramatic, was getting too stiff and nearly impossible to handle or see slippage or all kinds of weird stuff. So what we want to achieve in those processes is to combine the raw materials from the sheath as well as from the inner in a certain way that 
the materials worked in a perfect way together in the rope while braiding or after it had been braided. And this during the whole lifespan. And this is the, the big challenge in the art of braiding. Doing this kind of stuff for more than 150 years now, um, it's a lot of knowledge, in-house knowledge um, we are having. And, um, thinking about what we ourselves can do to improve ropes or to improve sustainability with our project, um, just as an idea of what a good product is, um, is a huge motivation, I guess. Join us for our next Inside Out episode, where we'll be exploring how Edelrid is reducing their environmental footprint of their products and their operations.